Uh, hello, my name is Will Sola. I work for Drilling Info. We are a leader in oil and gas information and analytics. Uh, our product is a website you go to to view all of this. And uh, I'm going to talk about the GitHub pull request builder workflow. And so a little background on me. Uh, my previous company, we were using Subversion and I was, you know, I'm on the mailing list and I saw people talking about Git, Garrett, and uh, pre-commit or pre-merge testing. And I was like, that's really cool because you can get the results not just of your branch, but of the merge of your stuff to the branch, or not just your branch, but the merge from your branch to the main line and get the results on that. But we were using Subversion, so no go. Then I went to another company, Drilling Info, and we were, they were using Git for their new platform. And I was like, sweet, you know, I can implement Garrett here, and uh, you know, we can get some of this pre-commit pre testing going on. Well, I talked to the developers about it, and they didn't like Garrett. They didn't want to use Garrett. They wanted to use GitHub. So I was like, okay, you know, maybe I can use it in some other way or something, or sneak it in behind y'all. But uh, I was at the user, Jenkins user conference last year, and I overheard people talking about the GitHub pull request builder that had just come out. And that's when a light bulb went off. I was like, finally, I can implement this. So I went back to my job and uh, started messing around with it, my own little Jenkins run in my box, and uh, had a couple problems, but I worked through those, got it working, went and implemented it in our main Jenkins, and suddenly the developers are seeing messages like test pass, test failed on their pull requests. They came to me, they're like, Will, you know, what is this stuff? I was like, that is Jenkins running the merge of your pull request and then running the test against it. So if you were to merge right now, that's what the results are gonna be. They're like, this is some pretty cool stuff. And that's when I realized that I've introduced like a new little workflow for it. So where is this workflow in the software development lifecycle? And you got it's all spread out. Well, it's this little circle, you know, just going off the little dev part of, you know, just you know, continuous CI, or that's redundant, but uh, a little CI loop going, and uh, you know, you don't have to do anything for it. So what is the actual workflow? Well, you, just like normal, create your feature branch and begin your work. If you're going to do test-driven development, then you want to write all your tests and commit those ahead of time and then open the pull request. And immediately the test will fail because that's what's supposed to happen. If you're not doing test-driven development or you're just making a small little change or whatever, then after your first commit, just go in and open a pull request. And then after that, you just continue pushing to your feature branch as normal. Uh, it'll, the test will just continuously run every time you do a commit and every time you push to your branch and uh, you know you're done if you're doing test driven development when your tests all pass. And you know mm, somewhat when you're done with the, you know, if you haven't written any tests when you haven't caused any regressions and you hope it's done. So, uh, you know, you profit from CI on a dev branch. It's pretty cool stuff. Normally you gotta go and set up multiple branches and things like that. This just automatically does it. Now one of the problems you might run into if you just have you know, all these pull requests open is someone may go in, look at the pull request into, the, into their repo and go, ah, oh, I'm gonna pull this in now. Well, you're not done yet. So, so you know, if you don't have test driven development, you know, they can pull at any time. And so one of the things you can do to mitigate that is either put you know, in progress in the title of, of your pull request and then delete it afterwards. Or what, what we do is we use Combinary, or this applies, you know, you could do a similar thing to Greenhopper or any other of those tools, is um, when you're ready for the card to be reviewed, you put a check mark on it and then the pull request. So people know, okay, now I can review this card and get it going. If you're using Greenhopper, there's not check marks, but you can make another ready to review column or something similar to that. So how exactly do you run your tests with the uh, GitHub pull request builder? And there's two main things you need to think about, and it's all based on your code base. If it's one monolithic, gigantic code base, you know, generally coming from the past, because that's what we did, um, it's super easy because your uh, GitHub pull request builder build is exactly the same as your normal build. You just run your tests like normal. Now, if you actually have your tests in the same repo as your, your monolithic code base, but they're in two separate Jenkins jobs, then you need to go more the module, submodule route. And especially if you're doing what's more common now where you have a bunch of little modules doing their own little thing, you definitely have to go the second route. It's a little harder, but it's definitely doable. 
So if your tests are in the same repo, but you got two separate jobs, then all you have to do is pass the SHA and the REF spec to the downstream jobs so that it will check out the correct uh, pull request and then run that. If you're doing, uh, you know, you have widget A that depends on widget B, then what you need to do is publish to a different location. Uh, generally, I like to do, you know, com, company, widget, dot PR, so that they're all clumped together in one spot. This means your uh, publication to your uh, repository manager needs to be parameterized and defaults to probably your, your, your main build. Um, you know, if you're using Bower, then it's a little bit easier because you can just point to that specific SHA or even a local copy that you can clone out. If uh, you're using Ivy or Maven, then uh, you're going to have to do more of that passing the parameter and, and pull it down. Now there's other things you can do besides just testing. You can, like we have our engineering documentation, we use Wintersmith to, de to uh, deploy it so that we can get everything in Markdown and get it deployed. You know, same concept will apply if you're using Jekyll or something like that. Now why would you want to do this? Like your developers can just go in and look at the Markdown and, and review it. Well, if you're using GitHub Enterprise like we are, then not everyone has a license to, to go into GitHub to even view it. Uh, sometimes your salespeople aren't the most tech savvy people, so you know you can just point them to a web page and say, you know, here it is. Even also your uh, designers, if they want to see, you know, what the finished product will actually look like, then this actually deploys what the build is. It deploys if it's merged right now, this is what it'll look like, and so then you can go and send them a link to a web page. Uh, so how do you do this? You do your documentation build as normal. You change the deploy location if it's a pull request, which you can check from the SHA, and you I like to deploy to a PR folder. It, uh, it's kind of along the same lines as when you deploy to a repository manager. You run your deploy as normal since your deploy location has changed, it's gone to a different place. And then in your main build, you make sure to go in and delete that pull request deploy. Uh, what else can you do? So if you are developing on a server and you have a code developer working on the client, you can continuously deploy your server so that as he continuously builds his client, he can make sure it hits the server. Um, also, if you're using like a monolithic code base or you know, even maybe with the, more, the multiple modules, you can deploy it out to a, the, a site and have your customers come and you know, some beta customers come and look at what the next stuff is coming in. Like if you got a next branch you could open a pull request from that and then see, you know, get that deployed and see what it, it's used. What I also like to do is close the feedback loop of when did this pull request get in? Like, is this in a build? Did it, I see it's closed, but did it get integrated or something weird happened? So I like to have my main build go and comment in there with the build number it was pulled in. Um, some of the problems I ran across that I discussed earlier, or mentioned earlier, is that um, self-signed SSL uh, our um, GitHub Enterprise has self-signed uh, certificate, and using some of the older Git plugins, the logging was not very good. It was telling me I was going, can't reach public GitHub. I was like, I'm not going to public GitHub. Why, why are you doing this? So I finally upgraded all the plugins, and then it says, oh, you know, key's bad. You know, this is a bad certificate. I was like, ah, there we go. Finally, some information. So I had to go in and do some Java key signing in order to get um, it to connect correctly. Another weird thing about it is uh, the URL to Jenkins is actually in two separate spots. There's the main uh, Jenkins URL from your global config, but then at the bottom in the advanced section is another URL for Jenkins. So you got to make sure both of those are right. And then that advanced section is a little button at the very bottom of the global config page to the right kind of hard to see. I missed it. I opened an issue into the get a pull request plugin. I was like, where do I put my token ID? He was like, there's a button there. You got to hit that and you can see it. I was like, oh, sweet. And that's where the other URL is. So, you know, that's pretty good. I would like to give a big thanks to our sponsors. And if I have any time, we'll open it to questions. Five minutes? How, how do you configure Seconds.